Well, you might have heard that we got uh, struck by lightning as we were landing in uh, Israel. And we didn't get to land in Israel, so we got diverted here to uh, the island of Cyprus. We're in Paphos, where Paul preached the gospel. We're not complaining. We're not complaining at no. all. We're very thankful to be <laughs> here, and we fly to Israel today. But may God bless you guys as you study the Word tonight. And please be praying for the uh, conference that's starting uh, today. So God bless you guys, and grace and peace to you from the island of Cyprus, city of Paphos. Well, hello, shalom from Megiddo. Got to say shalom. Got to say shalom. shalom. And uh, we're here at Megiddo, and this is way, it's a tell, which is a dig, an archaeological dig, a hill that has layers and layers of civilization and hovers over the valley of Armageddon. And you know what's going to happen in the valley of Armageddon when the nations of the world come together against Israel. God's going to win that war. And we'll talk about that more in the weeks to come. But please pray for Shannon and I as we head down to the Ohayim Conference in uh, Neva Alin, Ilan, Neva Ilan, and which is just east of Jerusalem. And pray for us that God would do great things in us and through us as we encourage the people that are laboring hard against abortion in this land. And really, they're coming from nations all over the world. So please be in prayer that it'll be a fruitful time and pray for our trip back home that it will be uneventful and no lightning strikes this time. Shalom. Just so you're clear that their plane was struck by lightning, they weren't struck by lightning in case you thought that had happened, but it had not. Well, this is the second uh, teaching that I've done here now in a row, and both of them have to do with hypocrisy. Of all things, it's like, man, couldn't I have got a different topic? And so I wanna, tonight, I want to look at the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. I want to talk about that, uh, but I also want to bring out something positive maybe for us as well, so you don't just hear me talking about hypocrisy, although I think it's important. I, I talked about it this last week, and I think that with the world views around us and when they look at the church, a lot of people, a lot of people look at the church and they think it's filled with hypocrisy. And I, and I said it this week and I said, where there's smoke, there's fire. And so, so if it's true, if there's hypocrisy in the church, then we need to be aware of it. We need to look at ourselves. We need to be introspective and see, is it true within me? Is there anything that God, you would deal with that maybe I'm, that I am hip hypocritical. Maybe I have that within me. And so we want to look at that tonight a little bit further. Um, the truth is, if, I think if we're honest with ourselves, uh, there probably are parts of ourselves where we, um, we live our lives and we don't practice what we preach, where we require more of someone else than we require of ourselves. I think if we really truly looked at ourselves, maybe it's of our kids, of our spouses, maybe our husband, we require more of him than we require of ourselves or her, our wives. Maybe our coworkers, we just think, man, how could you do that? But we do the, the same things that they do. Um, areas where we, maybe we tiptoe between the world and, and our spirituality and we maybe just tiptoe over to the world side a little bit. I think that's in all of us. If we're honest, I think there is this level of hypocrisy that we all deal with. So when the world looks in at us and they say, man, there's hypocrisy in the church, sometimes they're right. Again, we said last, this weekend that it, not all accounts, we're not hypo hypocritical on all, all fronts, but I do think we need to take a very good look at ourselves and say, man, is there anything that's not right within me. And I said this week, and I said, he kept it G-rated. Verses 1 through 12, Matthew chapter 23, 1 through 12, it was very G-rated. Jesus addresses the issue. He kind of gets them a little bit, and he says, listen, these scribes and their Pharisees, they're hypocritical. And listen, he's talking to his, his disciples and the crowds, and he's saying, listen, when I'm gone, I don't want you to be like them. And so let me just, let me just tell you, this is the way not to be. They say one thing, and they do another thing. You can't take them for their word. Don't be like that. And then I promised you, I said, tonight, if you came, it's going to get PG rated. So we're going to up the ante a little bit. And, and he gets a little bit more harsh with these religious people. Like he is going to, in fact, I'll just say he's, he, gets, he gets really harsh with them. He's really going to lay into them tonight. And so we're going to look at these passages. If you would, turn with me to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. And here's the matter. Here's why this is so important, is that when the world looks at us, we want them to see people who are genuine in their faith, who really too believe something and have a set of values 
that they also live by. They don't just say it, but they're genuine in it. And so we want to be careful in any ways that we're not genuine. In any ways we've said one thing, we've done another. We want to be careful not to do that. Like the scribes and the Pharisees, here's what has happened. Jesus lays out for us tonight seven woes. So if you're a note taker, check this out. This is the greatest thing about being a note taker. You always know where the, the preacher is or the pastor or the teacher is, right? So if you're taking notes, you can just write down number one, and you know when number two comes, number three, four. I'm almost there. He's almost at seven. So let me encourage you tonight. Be a note taker. Woe number one. You can write this down. Woe number one. There's seven of them. Jesus is going to lay this out as this. The religious leaders, by their actions, failed to lead others to Jesus. The religious leaders, the very ones that should be spearheading this movement towards Jesus and the Messiah, actually were leading people by their actions away from Jesus. Look at verse 13. He says this, But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, he says. He uses the H word, hypocrites. For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. He calls them hypocrites. What do we remember about hypocrites? Hypocrites are like actors. They, they put on a false front to act, to, to, to put on a story or a presentation. They're not really those people. They put on masks. And so he's saying to them, listen, you put on masks. You, you hide the true self. You are hypocrites. And then he moves on and he says this. These men, these Pharisees, these scribes, they don't adhere to Jesus' kingdom teaching. So all through Matthew, a big theme in Matthew is Jesus leading people to his kingdom. What it's like to live in God's kingdom. Blessed are the fill in the blank, the meek, the merciful, those that care about people. Blessed are the, and he talks a lot about what it means to be someone in, in, in Christ's kingdom. And in fact, he points to himself, I am the key to this kingdom. I'm central to this kingdom. And he's saying to, to the people, he said, listen, woe to you Pharisees. Woe to you, for you shut up the gates of that kingdom. You try to keep people out of the kingdom that I'm trying to usher people into. Not only, he says, do you not go into the kingdom, but you prevent other people who want to get into the kingdom, who think, oh, that teaching, that's powerful. I want to go to that kingdom. He says, no, no, you shut the doors on those people. You actually prevent them from coming to me. How did they do it? We saw this weekend in verses 1 through 12, there's this thing called Moses' seat. They sit, these scribes and Pharisees, they sit in places of honor. And the people look up to them because they're the leaders of their religion. And so when they say something, it's powerful on the people. And so that by their words and their actions, they were leading people because of the authority they had been given away from Jesus, away from his kingdom. Now, what do we learn from the negative part of the scribes and the Pharisees? What do we learn about ourselves and who we should be? This is what we learn. We need to be genuine signposts that point to Jesus. We need to be genuine signposts that, that point to Jesus. In the way that the Pharisees and the scribes were signposts saying, go away from Jesus, go away from his teaching, go away from his kingdom, we need a people who signposts that say, go towards Jesus, go towards his kingdom. We do that with our lives and our actions and our words. And I would ask the question, what kingdom do we, are we building? The scribes and the Pharisees were building their own kingdom based on their own human rules and regulations, and they wanted people to have nothing to do with Jesus. What kingdom are we building? Is it a kingdom that points towards Jesus or a kingdom that points away from Jesus? And we have only to look at our own lives. Does my life, when I'm at work, when I'm at school, when I'm with my family, does my life point to Jesus or do somehow do I distort it with who I am? Be careful what message we are sending. Then I want you to see verse 14. Okay, now here's the question. I always get these. Why me? Right? Raise your hand if you have verse 14 in your Bibles. 
Why? Raise your hand if you don't have verse 14 in your Bibles. Come on. I mean, Bill, don't give me the ones with their missing passages. So if you have New King James Version, which is, I'm guessing, the majority of you, it's in your Bible. Now, if you have the NIV or the ESV, not there. Not there. Why? Why did one put it and why did the other not put it? Well, they're both based on different variants or texts. So one of them is taking the earliest manuscripts and saying that wasn't in the earliest manuscripts of Matthew. That's the NIV and the ESV. And they're saying, doesn't count. We're not going to put it in there. Now, here's the funky thing about it. It's actually in Mark chapter 12. I'm sorry, Mark, yeah, Mark chapter 12, verse 40. This verse is in Mark chapter 12, verse 40. So did Jesus say it? Yes, right? Did he say it here? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe we know he said it at some point. So here's what he says, and it's really a heavy indictment against the scribes and the Pharisees. In fact, it's one like we haven't seen before. Listen to what he says here. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You see the pattern? For you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. Therefore, you will receive greater condemnation. Listen. People were coming to them, and they were saying, you're a, a man of law. You're a man of God. You're someone to be respected. We trust you, right? And, and listen, widows, in their culture, when a man would die, your, your husband would die, and you were left to be a widow, there was no governmental support system. You were on your own. I mean, when we talk about widows, they had nothing or no one and nobody, unless another relative came along and, and took on that responsibility. So what he's saying here is, listen, people have trusted you, religious men, and you take advantage of widows. So what would happen is they would come to them and say, listen, here's my property. Would you help me manage this well? And they would say, sure, we'll help you manage this well. In fact, maybe you should give it to the temple, or maybe you should give it to my ministry. And they, they would take the property away from the widows to themselves or even to the temple. And he's, listen to what he says there. He says, listen, you devour widows' houses. You take their properties. Religious men, trustworthy men. That's about as low as it gets. You take advantage of people in our culture who have nothing for your own gain. That's about as evil as you can be. And we don't see that as, as, as clear anywhere else where it just says, man, these guys, they had a thing about them, a way about them. So listen, number one, number one, the first woe, the first woe was that these men were leading people away from Jesus. They were not good signposts to God. And so listen, this is our lesson. We need to be good, genuine signposts to Jesus. Woe number two, sharing the wrong message about God. Woe number two is they were sharing the wrong message about God. Look at verse 15. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, or a, like a Gentile, converted Gentile. You convert them over to Judaism. And when he is one, you have made, listen to this, you, have, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Whew. Jesus is, I'm telling you right now, Jesus is laying in on these guys. He's saying, listen, you go across the land and you reach out with your man-made religion where you're asking people to work to get to heaven, basically work to be in good graces with God. You've made up all these rules and regulations that aren't of God, and now you're putting it on people's backs. And he's saying, you're going across the land, you're finding these people, and when you find them, you convert them, but you convert them over to something that's nowhere near what God has called you to do. You've misrepresented God. Yeah, you won them, but you won them to something that was not of God. What do we need to learn from the scribes and the Pharisees in this negative example? Listen, make converts to Jesus, not to our thoughts or our philosophies that when we convert people, what we're looking for is to convert them to Jesus, the key to the kingdom, not to the Calvary way, not to the Baptist way or the Methodist way or the Bill Welsh way or the Chuck Smith way. 
And those are all great ways, but the conversion is not to these men or to these churches, but we convert them to Christ. Or else we run the risk of doing the same things the Pharisees were doing and saying, this is the way you have to do it if you're going to be in God's graces, if you're going to be in his good ways, then you have to choose this way. Or it's the highway. So, there we go. We're on two woes. You're doing good. So listen, signposts, we need to be a genuine signpost to Jesus. Secondly, we need to convert people to Jesus, not our ways. And woe number three. Listen, they were not, this is the woe number three, saying, listen guys, listen, Pharisees, scribes. He says this, you are not men of honor or of integrity. Duh. (laughs) You're taking widows' houses, right? You're not men of honor or of integrity. Look at verse 16. Woe to you, blind guides, which is always a scary proposition, right, if your guide is blind. And he's calling him that. He's saying, listen, you're, you're like blind people leading people, spiritually blind, of course, who say, listen, verse 16, who say, whoever swears by the temple, it is nothing. But whoever swears by the gold of the temple, he is obliged to perform it. Fools and blind. <laughs> Fools and blind, for which is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold? Now, you're scratching your head, and I understand. So I'll get to it in a second, but let's finish because he's going to keep the same line of thought. Look at verse 18. And whoever swears by the altar, it is nothing. But whoever swears by the gift that is on it, he is obliged to perform it. Fools and blind, for which is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifies the gift? Look at verse 20. Therefore... He who swears by altar, swears by it, and by all things on it. He who swears by the temple, swears by it, and him who dwells in it. And he who swears by heaven, swears by the throne of God, and by him who sits on it. Listen, the Jews had this complicated oath system that if you were going to make a deal, or you were going to talk to God, and you would say, I swear by, somehow that would seal the deal. You know, we sign things these days. They would swear by an oath. Now, when they involved God in the swearing of that oath, it all of a sudden was like, oh, if God is in this, in this swearing, if I was going to make a deal with you and I say, I swear by his temple or I swear by this, then all of a sudden it meant even more because now if I break the promise or you break the promise, we're in trouble with God, right? So what they would do, It was they'd find lesser ways to say, listen, I swear by the gold on the temple, or I swear by the temple. And they would somehow maneuver it away so they would not have to follow through with their promise. It's kind of like today when you walk up to you, uh, to somebody, or maybe you did this. When, not, you would, none of you would do this today. My kids would do it on the playground. And you hold your hand behind your back, and what do you do? You cross your fingers. And you say, I will, I will make a deal. I'll trade my lunch tomorrow for your lunch tomorrow, right? And, and then you don't do it. You don't follow through on the promise. And so what was happening here is these men who were supposed to be religious, godly men were not men of honor or of integrity, and they wouldn't follow through, and they'd say, see, I didn't really swear by the more powerful thing. I swore for a lesser thing. Therefore, I don't have to follow through with my promise. We see this also, too, in uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 33. says, Jesus addresses this with them. He says, again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. In other words, do what you say that you're going to do. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. In other words, all these things belong to the Lord. So if you say, I swear by that chair, it's his chair, and you're really just swearing to God anyways. Just don't do it, right? You don't need to do it. It all belongs to the Lord. Whether it's the gold or the temple, whether it's the altar or the gift, it all belongs to the Lord. So your little game that you're playing, the Pharisees and the scribes, it doesn't make any sense, and, and it's all the Lord's anyways. So Jesus just says this in verse 37 of, of 5. He says, but let your what? Yes be yes, and your no be no. Be men of integrity and honor. Stop 
the nonsense. Woe to you because you do not have this integrity and the honor. But listen, we need to be men and women of honor. That when people see us and they hear from us, when we make a business transaction, when we talk to our kids, when we talk to our spouses, we need to be people of honor. Don't fall into the trap of making promises and kind of not doing them and not following through. So number one, we need to be genuine signposts that point to Jesus. Number two, we need to convert people to Jesus, not our own philosophies or our ways of thinking. And number three, we need to be men and women of our word. Number four, woe. There were majoring, listen, number four, woe. They were majoring in the minors of religious performance. I'll say that again. They were majoring in the minors of their religious performance. It'll make more sense when you read 23. Woe to you, he says. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. Hypocrites. For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. What did they do? They were commanded, listen, they were commanded in Deuteronomy chapter 14, they were commanded that they should tithe of their harvest and of their wine and of their oil and of the firstborn of their cattle. They were, they were commanded to do it. And these Pharisees, they took it all the way to a whole nother level where they would take their own little gardens at home, right? Not their harvest, not their big harvest, but just their little home gardens, right? A little bit of basil and a little bit of cumin, right? A little bit of anise, and, and they would just divide it out. Even They're saying, listen, God, we want to be so holy in your eyes. We want to be so holy in front of the people that we'll even take our little gardens at home, and we'll take, take a tenth out of that, and we'll give that away. And Jesus said, great, that's awesome, you should do that. That's very good of you. Good job. But listen, you do that, and then you neglect the bigger matters, the weightier matters of what God's called you to be. Yeah, you gave the tenth. Awesome. But what about mercy and justice and faith? And you're taking widows' houses. It's head scratcher. It's like, what are you doing? Like in the little tiny things that people see you're good at, but the thing that's in your heart, the thing that you should be good at, I look at your lives and I think, man, scribes and Pharisees, what are you doing? He almost makes kind of a joke about it, right? So they would, back in the day, or they would have, a, they'd have their wine, right? And if a little gnat flew in their wine, they would pour out the wine into a different cup and they would put a, a cloth on top of it and it would strain out any bugs that went in because the bugs were unholy and they weren't allowed to drink those bugs. And so they would strain out the gnat and he's saying, listen, you strain out the little tiny dinky little gnat but you swallow the camel. And he's, it's like a little rib, a little joke at them. Like, come on. Like, you're, you're there working on the little gnat but you're hoarding this camel down. They were, listen... They were, they were minoring in the majors and majoring in the minors, the little things. Here's the positive for us. Listen, we need to major in the majors of God's kingdom. We need to major in the majors, those big things that God has called us to be and to do. We need to major in those things. They had a different view of God altogether. The concern for the remaining religious took precedent over what was really important. And there's the question I'd ask you. When I ask you, what are the majors, what, and, and think about it for a second, what are the majors that you and I believe God cares the most about? What are those things that, you know, just you would say, man, if, if I look at my religious life, if I look at my Christian upbringing, what are those things that God cares the most about? I'd have to say that some of us would have to say, like, church attendance is a big one. Like, I need to make sure my fanny's in the door once a week at least, sometimes twice. And I would say, you know, would I, do I read my Bible? Those are the two, like, those are two big ones. 
that I would say over time, that's kind of what we've been taught. Like those are the biggest things. But, but what about mercy and justice and faith, trusting God? What about showing mercy to those who don't deserve mercy? How about standing up for people that need justice? Standing up for justice in times when, when there isn't any. That's what it seems like God's saying here. He's like, listen, look, you, 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 you do the 10%. That's good. You should do that. We should read our Bibles. We should come to church. Those are great things. You should do those things. But is that the major? Is that the thing that God says above all else? Read your Bibles and go to church. And we're good. Are those the majors? Or is that more like tithe of my our herbal garden at home? There's the minors. And again, I, I don't want to be I don't want to devalue. I, I believe reading your Bible on a consistent basis is important. It is. Being here amongst the body of Christ, receiving the teaching of the word, important. Those are huge. But we look at God's word and it says these are majors, mercy, justice, faith. Look at Micah 6, 8. Listen, God has just listed all that he has done for his people. He said, listen, I've delivered you from Egypt. I've done all these things for you in Micah 6, 8. And then Micah writes, kind of asking, and it's kind of rhetorical questions, but he says, what does God desire from us? What does God want from us? What's the most important thing? He says this in verse 6. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? What do I bring to him? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings? With calves a year old? Because that's what he said. He wants those things. Will the Lord be pleased with a thousand rams, ten thousand rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgressions? the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. And then he says in verse 8, He has shown you, O mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. There's something powerful about justice and mercy. And, and here it says humbly, you know, faithfully with your God. There's something powerful there. That, those are the big things. Those are the majors of what God is asking his people. And so I think we need to look at ourselves and say, listen, am I majoring in the majors of the things that God has asked of me? Again, I don't want to devalue the, the, the other things, the other requirements. Those are important. But am I majoring in the majors? Am I heart seeking after those things? So, listen, number one, we need genuine signposts for Jesus that point to him. Secondly, we convert people to Jesus, not to our own ways Third, we need to be men and women of our word, honorable and integrity, and we need to major in the majors. And woe number five, and if you're taking notes, you know, five, six, seven. All right, here we go. Woe number five. Creating an appearance of purity in the midst of internal filth. (laughs) Creating an appearance of purity in the midst of internal filth. And woe number five, here's what he says. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion, theft or robbery, stealing, and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them may be clean also. They take the care of the external look, What do I look like from the outside? We know this from the passage 1 through 12, that the reason why they did this is that so people would look at them and think, oh, you're so holy, you're so amazing. And they would get all the the public admiration from the people, and they would say, oh, yes. We know they had the intention. Why they kept it so clean on the outside was they wanted to look good to people. I probably not so much unlike ourselves, right? We want to look good to people. We want to look good. I mean, we want our husbands to respect us and, and, and know that we're godly and our wives to think we're godly and our coworkers. And we have all these 
when you come here, right, we want to look good to people, like we fit in, like this is, yeah, we're good, we're, we're good Christian people. We all have that desire, so it's not so much unlike the scribes and Pharisees. They worried about what they looked like on the outside. But listen, no one wants to drink from a cup that's only clean on the outside, but it is gross and moldy and filthy on the inside. And let me tell you, let me tell you, it is hard to keep up the presence of the outside when the inside is dead and filthy and disgusting. Look at Luke 6, 43. I'll read it to you. In verse 43, Jesus, staying consistent with the theme, right? He says, no good tree bears bad fruit. In other words, we can identify what you look like on the outside is indicative of what's going on on the inside, unless you are good at hiding it. Nor does a bad tree bear bad fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes. They don't grow there. Or grapes from briars. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. And so only, it's only a matter of time as we try to keep the outside of our cups clean. As the Pharisees were trying to keep the outsides clean and, hey, respect me, respect me. Because I am this religious leader and I am holy and I am good. And Jesus is saying, "Uh uh-uh, I don't buy it. I don't believe that for a second. It's filthy inside that cup. It might be white on the outside, but it is dirty on the inside. Focus on the inside even more than the outside. There's got to be something in you and I, positive note, you and I that measures that barometer. We need to be consistently asking ourselves, what am I doing? What does my internal inside look like? What does my heart look like? So he goes on to woe number six, and we're there. Woe number six, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanliness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. So what's he talking about there? What would happen would be, uh, over time, you would, you would bury your family in tombs, um, and, and Jews could not go near dead bodies, right? Because they, that's unclean, right? And so you would be stuck. You'd, you'd have to become clean again, and there's a process to do that. And so what they would do, in order to warn you that you're approaching dead bodies, is that they would make these tombs whitewashed. And so you would be able to clearly see it, and it maybe would be quite beautiful to see this clean tomb looking so white and clean. But they would do it so you wouldn't get near it, and you could easily see it. Could you imagine they didn't have gardeners back there trimming the tombs probably? And so it would become overgrown and hard to see. So if you were a visitor and you're walking into an area, and it wasn't like they just had graveyards, they had places all over where people would bury their families. And so before you would approach, you'd be able to say, oh, I see a white area. It's a tomb. I want to stay away from there. It looks beautiful on the outside, but I'm guessing that I don't need to get near there if I'm a good Jew. And so I would stay away because what he would say here is, listen, you are just like that whitewashed tomb. Beautiful on the outside, but inside that tomb, we know what's in there. It's death. And he's saying, listen, Pharisees, you are just like that. Looks great on the outside, but death is inside. So listen, number one, signposts that point to Jesus. Convert people to Jesus, not to our own way. Be men and women of our word, integrous. Major on the majors. Listen, you and I need to look inside more than we look on the outside. We need to take good spiritual inventory. Where am I at with the Lord? Do my actions match up with what I'm trying to present on the outside and with what I'm saying? And the last woe. Hypocrisy, listen, woe number seven. Hypocrisy leads to blindness and destruction. Hypocrisy leads to blindness and destruction. Verse 29 says this. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous and say, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. 
Jesus then says, therefore, you are witnesses against yourselves and that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measures of the father's guilt, serpents, brood of vipers. How can you escape the condemnation of hell? Therefore, indeed, I send you, this is Jesus now saying, therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. 35. That on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth, from the blood of the righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechai, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation." Woe number seven has to do with this. Hypocrisy leads to blindness and destruction. Why? Because what they were saying is, listen, Jesus, come on. If we were alive back when our forefathers were alive, we would never have done what they did, those heinous acts of killing these prophets, hunting them down and and killing them. We would never have done that. In fact, look at Jesus. We made tombs for them. And we adorn these tombs so they look so good because we want to honor our prophets. And Jesus says, listen, here's the deal. In a little while here, including me, my, the, the Messiah, the Christ. And in fact, I already know something about you, Pharisees and scribes. You've already started to plan how you're going to kill me, ironically. That somehow they had missed it. They'd become blind to the very fact that they were already planning how we're going to get Jesus. How are we going to kill this guy, this prophet? And they're saying to themselves, we would never have done that. We would never have done what our forefathers did. We honor our prophets. And he's saying, listen, you're blind. You're hypocrites. They've fallen short to this blindness. And he goes on, he, he says, listen, you're going to do this as time moves on. And who do we know in the New Testament that was part of this plan, part of this Jesus prophesying forward? Paul, right? Saul at the time became Paul. What did he do? He hunted down Christians. So we see it fulfilled in Acts, this prophecy that Jesus says, listen, this is going to be something that you're going to do for a long time. You're going to be just like your forefathers. And you're going to hunt down scribes, Christians, prophets. Now listen, this is a little bit interesting when he gets to this idea that um, he went from Abel to Zechariah. Well, who's Abel? Cain and very beginning, first martyr, right? Died. So he kind of bookending, some believe, bookending what the Jews had as their, their Bible, their Old Testament, right? From the very beginning, Abel, first martyr, to Zechariah in Second Chronicles, which, which he was killed in the altar, by the altar. Now, some believe that this was not the same Zechariah. So when you look at this, you look at it, he says uh, in verse 35, it says that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth from the blood of the righteous Abel, which had been Cain and Abel, to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechai. Now, interesting thing about that is that the Zechariah that's in Second Chronicles, is his father is not Berechai, uh, instead, you can look in here where it says in Second Chronicles twenty four twenty, uh, his father uh, was was um, Jehoadai. His father was Jehoadai. So now the question is, well, what did Jesus mean? Did he, is he talking like this is the Old Testament and he's bookending and he's saying, listen, you've done this all the way through the Old Testament, or is there another Zechariah killed very similar in the same way, but both of them killed by the scribes and the Pharisees' forefathers. And the, the danger in all of this is that they were spiritually insensitive to their history and to their past. They didn't see it. They couldn't see it. It wasn't there. And I think the same thing is a warning for us. We need to be sensitive to, to that, man, hypocrisy is a dangerous thing. It's blinding and it's destructive. And just like Jesus is warning his followers and the crowds that day, he's saying, listen, they are destructive, and they don't even know their past. They don't even see it. 
They think that they're, they're, they're somehow better than their forefathers when they're just like their forefathers. So let's go back and look at the six, seven things. Signposts that point to Jesus. This is what we need to become. Convert people to Jesus, not our way. Be men and women of our word. Be, have integrity. Major on the majors. Still do the minors, but major on the majors. Look inside more than we look outside, internally. And listen, be spiritually awake. And here's where Jesus closes, and where we're closed tonight. Jesus says this in 37. I love this because I think it's the heart of God. It is the heart of God, and it's expressed through his son. And Jesus says this, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks and under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate, for I say to you, you shall be, you will see me no more till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The idea of the desolation there, many think is that in, in about 40 years from that moment, uh, the temple will be leveled and the city of Jerusalem will be leveled by Rome. And, and the people who love their city and love their land, the Jews, uh, will be left to think, what happened? And, and the thought here is Jesus knows that moment's coming. And he tried to call him. He tried to call him. Come to me. Come into my kingdom. Walk with me. Live with me. Accept me as your Messiah and your king. And they wouldn't hear him. And they wouldn't do it. I love the fact that Jesus' heart is broken here. I think sometimes we get the idea that God is some distant God who doesn't care. And he's not, he's not accessible to us. Or that he's angry. But here we learn here that the heart of God in his son, who is the exact representation of the father, we know that from scripture, Jesus is the exact representation of the father. He is saying to him, listen, come to me. I called you. I wanted to be with you. I implored you. I implored you. I implored you. I wanted to gather you together and love you and, and teach you and instruct you. And we know the Pharisees went right against Jesus, right up in his face, and pulled people away out maybe from underneath his wing metaphorically. And saying, oh, no, don't go to him. Don't go to him. They use their authority. And this is his response to them, right? The last seven woes are his response to these scribes and these Pharisees with anger because they had stole people away from kingdom living. I love Jesus' emotion. It's reflective, I think, of God's emotion for us. That he said, I would gather you under my wings, that you would be my kids. That's how much the Father loves us. So I, I think tonight is a warning for us, but it's also a reminder that God loves us deeply. And it's the remainder time that we have here. I want to just kind of close in prayer. Um, and I'd love for us to close our eyes, and I want to read a portion of Psalm 139. And I, I just want the heart of, of this, this is the heart. Somehow the Pharisees and scribes, they missed it. And they were religious leaders. They were godly people of their day, although out externally and not internally. And I don't want to miss it. And I've studied now a couple of weeks on hypocrisy and the Lord's speaking to me and speaking to me and speaking to me. And I just keep telling him, Lord, I don't, if there's anything that's not right within me, I don't want to miss it. I don't want a name or a position or who I am or, or any of that to allow me to not see this thing that should be right in front of me. Because we can look at them and think it should have been right in front of them, but they missed it. And so I want to read one Psalm 139. And may this be our prayer as we close tonight. Here's what it says. Hmm. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. Then he asked this question in verse 7, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, 
Even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. I cannot hide, Lord, anything from you. And I don't want, Lord, to hide anything from you. God, if there's any area of our lives tonight where we live in hypocrisy, where we've misstepped our bounds, where we're, maybe we've missed the, the weightier matters of what we should believe and who we should be in you. Maybe we've majored in the minors and minored in the majors. God, if there's anything in us, Lord, I pray that you would reveal that to us. And he goes on in Psalm 139, he says, Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. I love this. See, Lord, and I pray this over us tonight. See if there is any offensive way in me, any way that I've offended you, any way that I've offended someone else, any way that I've kept someone from you, or any way that I've kept myself holy from you. And, and Lord God, lead me in the way of everlasting. God, I pray that this would be our prayer tonight. Reveal to us your truth. Lord, we want to be people who are genuine in our faith, who represent you well to all those people that you called us to reach out to. If there's any hindrance in that at all, Lord, I pray tonight would be a night we deal with that. We don't live another day, another moment, where we allow sin, inaccuracy, hypocrisy to reign in us. Lord, make us servants of you, holy, devoted to you. Amen. I know that um, one of the hardest things is, um, and we try not to do it as much, I think, is try to look at our own sins. It's something that we sometimes avoid. We don't try to look too hard at like, oh, I'll look, and then I kind of open an eye and I look back, or look the other way real quickly. And I think um, when we deal with this issue of hypocrisy, it's one of those things that it it's, it's can't come from the preacher. It's got to come from the Lord. It's got to come from the Lord. And it's got to be something where he just, in by his spirit, says, Jeff, come on. And it's not something that, that somebody else, it's sometimes even hard if it's our spouses or our friends and say, Jeff, come on. It's like, yeah, yeah, but not really. But if the Lord does it, then it stays, it sticks. It's like, oh, that is something I got to work on. And so my prayer for you um, is that the Lord would do that work. That maybe he's brought something a little bit to the surface and maybe you looked at it for a second, but then you're like, let's go on with life. And I would just say, if there's something there that the Lord's revealed to you, go to him, don't come to me. You don't have to come to me. Just go to him and say, God, I see this. It's not right. Would you deal with it within me? I don't want to look away too quickly. I want to keep my eyes focused on you, and I want to work on this with you. And I don't know what that is for you, but I would just say don't look away too quickly. Don't be in a hurry to rush away from it because God will deal with it very gracefully. He, he gently leads us to repentance. He disciplines the ones he loves. And so don't rush from that. Spend some time with that. And if that's tonight, do it tonight. You can do it in here. And if it's at home tonight where you're saying, Lord, is there anything that's not right? Yeah, I see it. Let's deal with it. Amen? Have a good night. This has been a presentation of Refuge Calvary Chapel Huntington Beach. For more information about our ministry, please visit refugefamily.com or call 714-891-9495. Set free.